So hello and welcome everybody. In today's episode of the Sacred Wisdom podcast, we are going to talk about the vault lights of Tartaria. Now, what I mean by the vault lights is in London, New York, Paris or Tokyo, you will notice these vault lights in the pavement or sidewalk. And these are little glass windows so you can actually get the light and go into the basement. But I would assume after the first mud flood, most of what is now the basement area would have actually been the ground floor. So, and you can see this all over the world in different cities, different locations where the mud flood supposedly happened. And I am joined with the wonderful Stephen Denman again today. So thank you, Steve, for coming. How are you doing? I'm doing well, Zach. I hope all's good with you. So first of all, Steve, talk, let's talk about these, these pavement lights and what were they? And in Tartaria, what was the purpose of these vault lights? What we know is that the, the white cities of Tartaria, where we know that there was a, a, a tremendous focus on developing a, a, an understanding of the Christ consciousness by the Nordic Tartarians, they would construct vast numbers of their buildings to have very deep basement areas. Now, these would have the electrical capacitors in. Sometimes those electrical capacitors would be on the ground floor. And obviously, as we've discussed in previous Sacred Wisdom podcasts, the telluric electricity would then be drawn down into these electrical generators in the in the ground floor or basement area of these stately homes or or mansions and so forth. Now, the purpose of having what what's become known as pavement lights or vault lights, uh, floor lights or sidewalk prisms in Great Tataria in northern Russia was so that they could actually transmit some of the electricity that had been absorbed into these electrical capacitors in the basement area of these buildings so they could then create a multi-coloured effect that would help with the healing, uh, the psychological stability, the emotional stability, and therefore the happiness and the contentment of the Nordic Tatarians, especially in the urban areas that we can define as towns and cities across Great Tataria in northern Russia. We know that these anadolic lighting prisms, as they've become known, were able to literally transmit out in various directions uh, multicolored light. And obviously they would they were designed with different geometric patterns that would have different lighting effects as the electricity was used to illuminate these basement areas. We do not know the exact lighting arrays that the Nordic Tatarians used in the basements of their vast palaces and stately homes and in their healing temples. But we do know there was an interplay between geometric shapes and obviously different lighting arrays or light fittings, all of which were powered by these electrical capacitors drawing down the telluric electricity from the antennae on the roofs of these buildings in Great Tataria. It does make sense with all the lights, the way you see these pictures, when you see the black and white pictures and the way the lights illuminated out of these buildings, it's yes. certainly a different type of electricity. And it's yes. not the normal type of light. And from what I've looked at, it would seem that sometimes these buildings, the light that they shone, they could even conduct electricity through them. So they could actually even send electricity through these this light or whatever frequency this was. So you would you say these the, the vault lights were they used for like a healing purpose? And the towns and cities of Great Tataria across northern Russia and all the different colonies that existed uh, of Great Tataria in obviously uh, the United States of America and obviously going down into Latin America and many other locations that was it was literally an outdoor um, sort of biological healing process was taking place with these various pavement lights, vault lights, or we can call them floor lights or sidewalk prisms. We know from that many, many of the very old uh, woodcuts that have come out of the Russian Federation. And if you do a lot of searches on parts of uh, Google or Yandex and various other search engines, you will find these woodcuts and you can clearly see what appears to be luminescent rays 
um, projecting outwardly from the walls or the base of the walls of many of these different stately homes or palaces in Great Tataria, in northern Russia, and also in other parts of the Asian continent. So we know that they had some kind of subsurface um, telluric electricity generation going on, and we know that they were using different types of coloured uh, glass in terms of the anodolic lighting prisms in, in the basement areas of these buildings. We also know that it was beneficial to the health of the Nordic Tatarians simply because of the longevity of that civilization. Although, you know, we know from Western science that it's never been officially accepted as a, you know, an authentic civilization. It's just classed as another conspiracy theory. You had the Edward Rockwell who put a patent in 1837 on the actual vault light, didn't you? And that's right. He's an interesting guy. So, what about that? That what what was going on there? Why, why did he put a patent on that light, for example, on these vault lights? You think we have to understand that with the collapse and the demise of Great Tatari in northern Russia, there was a consistent scientific and technical repurposing going on all around planet earth we have to also remember that many of these buildings that had existed in great Tatari, like within the united states of america and canada they had basement areas that would have originally been ground floor areas mm -hmm. so with the billions of tons of silt and gravel uh, and soil that would have infilled and literally destroyed the foundations of many of these buildings that possibly sunk by many feet into the ground and were buried. So the actual ground floor areas were obscured. So in terms of having to rebuild and restructure many of the cities in the United States of America, such as New York City, such as Chicago in the eastern United States, there had to be a, a whole scale approach of utilizing space that had originally been used for something else around these buildings. So mm -hmm. what is interesting is that this individual named Edward Rockwell, he had what was known as the 8058X Rockwell Vault Light, and he had that patented with the United States Patent Office or the USPO on the 8th of March, 1834. Now, he's obviously being designated as the inventor of the Rockwell vault light. Of course. And this individual called Edward Rockwell was looking to install these, uh, you know, these pavement lights or these uh, vault lights on the walkways of the streets in New York City. But it wasn't a case that there would be luminescent rays radiating out from the basements from the telluric electricity anymore that was once drawn down from the antennae on these beautiful ornate buildings, redifices in Great Tataria into basement electrical capacitors. And then they would actually power the lighting arrays that would then create the luminescence that would then, in a multicolored way, radiate out into the external areas of these cities. Now what was going to happen was these buildings would be full of individuals. There would be residents or employees that would have to pay for the use of that electricity. Um, and if there was not enough um, luminescence or uh, it wasn't well lit enough in those basements, the whole purpose of these pavement lights or vault lights was to then obviously through the process of redirecting the photons of sunlight, being able to literally then illuminate these basement areas that were classed as very dank and very dingy and perhaps very damp. Mm. And it's almost like a reversal because now you've got the street light shining the light within. And obviously yeah. previously, so going back to the inversion, it's like the complete reversal of that yeah. is, is quite incredible. It's interesting and obviously, that, yeah, but it's interesting to note that in Great Tataria, they were using bangless... Uh, amounts of telluric electricity to then obviously p generate uh, the lighting arrays in these basements that would then interact with the multicolored geometric uh, anodolic lighting prisms in their own pavement lights or vault lights. Yet what was happening there, the actual light was radiating outwardly from those buildings. I find it incredible. It then reversed. 
yeah, when, and, when it comes and, to Edward Rockwell, it was about allowing sunlight, which itself is boundless luminescence in that sense, into these basement areas, presumably, you know, at a time while whilst the electrical grid was still being rolled out, it was still in, in its rudimentary uh, stages back then. And, you know, it was it was preparing these buildings for the time when they would have to pay electricity bills. But many of them probably couldn't afford it at that point. Uh, maybe decades later, that would have changed. Again, this is sheer speculation, but those buildings would have needed that sunlight to come in to those basement areas because they were so dank. They weren't fully connected to any electrical grid. And you can see very clearly it was a total reversal that was taking place as to what had ex existed for many generations across the towns and cities of Great Dataria. So looking at the whole energy market, it would seem that it, it, it's completely been reversed because it's now it, it's something that we almost to have energy uh, in, in the form of electricity, gas, you know, there's a cost of living to that, like we spoke about many times before. So we've ended up in this kind of quite an imprisoned society where even like a high street, we end up spending money. Can you imagine walking down a high street with all these illuminated lights and mm. beautiful healing fractal patterns and, you know, and people smiling in a joyful state? That's right. That would be a different type of Oxford Street, that's for sure. <laughs> but if you just visualise the, the white cities of Tataria where – you know, they, they they were coated in this bright polychromatic white light that represented the Christ consciousness. And then you've got all these pavement lights or vault lights, the use of these anodolic lighting prisms, the mm. use of geometric shapes within the silicon dark side or glass blocks that were installed into the uh, polymer concrete, you know, walkways in the various towns and cities of Great Dataria. You're looking at a different kind of material world, one which where spirituality is given consistent emphasis and in this in the collective psychology or social psychology of the Nordic Tatarians, because the telluric electricity was free, it was boundless, it was endless, it was always there. Mm. It, there was it, there was so much of it, it was similar to fresh water or salt water or saline water. And as we've discussed in a previous Sacred Wisdom podcast, mm. the aspects of piezoelectric charge or current that can come off that, you know, and so. It's very interesting the psychological outlook would have been very different because there would have been much, uh, almost like an alleviation in the uh, human consciousness of the Nordic Tatarians where they didn't have to focus on the idea of money or debt banking to pay for electricity. Mm. And, you know, so these pavement lights or vault lights that they used and their versions of these anodolic uh, lighting prisms, you know, uh, was seen as something immensely important, but as just another component towards the continual biological healing and restoration and, and, the, and the maintaining of optimal health of their families, their children. So the Nordic Tatarians then were consistently able to free up a lot of their own time. They had obviously, they did obviously had, they had work, they had employment, but again, a lot of that was radically different than we perceive work and employment today in the modern period in the Western world. Well, if, if we were building to structures that at the core had positive mess, positive meanings and outcomes, the work wouldn't it wouldn't matter too much actually what type of work we were doing. We wouldn't actually get yeah, tired, absolutely. mentally yeah. drained, all these different aspects that people feel with work uh, in today's age. So do you think it all kind of shifted after the first mud flood? I mean... I think it was the beginning of the end, the first mud flood. It was it was so destructive. And then it was and again, we haven't we have discussed this before. It wasn't just these the first mud flood, the second mud flood, or the third Various, mud flood. Yes. We had all the volcanic activity that was going on, the collapse of the farmland, uh, and therefore the different types of agriculture. So they they couldn't really grow fruits, vegetables, and cereal crops. Mm. So there was major movements of, or a migration of populations from northern Russia into other parts of the Asian continent, obviously into Eastern Europe, Western Europe, so forth. So it was a, a literally a stage by stage, multi generational demise of a once incredible. A civilization really the golden empire of great tataria northern russia i just want to interject there steve and just say that a recent i, I recently visited a, sh a shop a map shop 
and uh, I actually found a map with the Great Tartaria on it. And I That's asked right, the yeah. guy in the shop about Great Tartaria, and he actually told me his great grandfather came from Great Tartaria. That's and actually yeah. migrated and all this and explained about the volcanic av- activity and all this stuff. So, yeah, I just wanted to put that across to the viewers because I thought that was very interesting. And I think the whole term conspiracy theory when it comes to Great Tataria in northern Russia and its colonies in the United States of America, Latin America and everywhere else. And we that were discussing in this Sacred Wisdom podcast, the pavement lights or the vault lights of Tataria. And when you look at that and all the different aspects and the components and every different cultural and spiritual uh, facet that define Great Tataria, it's almost if it's so, it's so far removed from the, the mindset of millions of human beings in the Western world that such a, a beautiful and elegant civilization that was based on always focusing on the Christ consciousness and and that's really what also the the actual boundless telluric electricity was about was doing that as with the pavement lights and the or the vault lights as they can be called in Great Tataria, and it's it's the way everything became so mundane, so despiritualized, so mechanized, so yeah. um, just so disconnected in many ways from the infinite oneness and the infinite nowness of the eternal mind of the universal creator of heaven and earth. It wasn't seen as anything relevant anymore by the vast majority of people. Everything was just, you know, seen as, you know, just as one of those things, a concept, an idea. And we're so, actually, you know, at core, when humans in our physical form, we're purely abundant creators. It is yeah. only our minds that are intercepted and changed and reshaped to make us believe that we're not abundant we have yeah. we are constant energy signals sending information out all the time so That's obviously right. and that comes from the mind so if we're getting told stuff from the media and messages all these external negative messages yeah. so yeah then we pass our abundance to other people and let obviously we allow controllers to then take control of reality and that that's unfortunately what's happened i feel yeah, and I think um, when you you look at the individual Edward Rockwell, you know he, his um, his concept of the pavement lights or vault lights, you know, in New York City and elsewhere, then was superseded on the nineteenth of September, eighteen fifty four, by another inventor in the United States, called Thaddeus Hyatt. Now, he was from right. the city of Railway, which is located in the Southern Union County, mid New Jersey, in the northeastern United States. Right. Now, he um, went down the same route, and he was obviously very interested in actually, you know, actually being the individual that could pronounce that he had invented some type of new pavement lights or uh, mm. vault lights design. And here we have, again, a, a layering of this reworking. He didn't. He wasn't particularly happy with the vault lights of Edward Rockwell, so he again went to the United States Patent and Trademark Office, the USPTO, as it was then called. It had obviously changed from its original uh, purpose and it had expanded. And he, he he instead he proposed the idea of using an iron plate that contained small silicon dioxide or glass pieces that were there to, um, uh, to really optimize the influx of uh, photon waves or sunlight into these basement areas of these dank buildings in New York City. We've got to remember that hundreds and hundreds of these buildings in New York City, as with Chicago, hmm. have uh, retaining walls in the basement areas that have been found by building inspectors and also by archaeologists to be far, far older than yep. the actual buildings above them that were would have been constructed during the Victorian age. It's still happening today. People still are digging out. It, it, people, yeah. you know, the construction companies taking buildings out and finding other basement floors, hidden basements, hidden floors to buildings. That's right. And we know that there are a few black and white photographs of construction crews in New York City and Chicago and other parts of the United States of America who have, are seen, you know, they've got scaffolding, they've got the excavation equipment, you know, they're digging out these areas and constructing from the basement up yeah. these various residential and commercial premises. But these photographs are few and far between. And we've got to remember that the, the amount of work involved in excavating that far below street level yeah, in a city like New York or or elsewhere like Chicago 
And we have to also remember the city of Chicago is purported to have been called Shalaga, which was originally yes. a white city of Dataria, yeah. uh, which was then obviously completely repurposed. We've gone into discussing this in previous Sacred Wisdom podcasts. And yeah, please, people, check that out. Look into that. It is unbelievable, really quite amazing. Yeah, absolutely. So we can see that the repurposing was an ongoing process how this was connected to the elites and secret societies, again, is open to speculation. But what we know is that this was an ongoing process over many decades and ultimately over centuries to create a, an almost absolute deletion of any idea that great Tataria in northern Russia and elsewhere on planet Earth ever existed as this golden empire based on the Christ consciousness the use of star forts, the use of antennae, the use of uh, electrical capacitors to draw down boundless or endless amounts of telluric electricity from the ether or the ionosphere above all these towns and cities. So what we're left with is just this almost mechanistic repurposing with so-called inventors patenting devices and, 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 and mechanisms and it's almost like everything went into reversal in slow stages, the, the, mm. the, the rolling back out of what had already existed, but in a spiritualized sense in Great Tataria. Yeah, it's amazing, Steve. That's incredible. Yeah, just understand, everybody, that the mud floods did happen. Like uh, mud floods make a lot of sense. If people understand liquefaction of soil, and obviously when things go underneath soil, that this can create a whole movement of plates and and huge areas there is obviously the sinkholes is not the same thing but that's a similar process isn't it where almost like the silt and underneath gets jarred and almost just takes land will just carry so yeah. these mud floods did happen somewhere because if you look at the first mud flood second mud flood third mud flood you know if everything's buried under billions and billions of tons of silt and gravel and soil and mm. buildings that were once maybe 150, 200, 250, 300 feet above ground level now literally are buried under, I don't know, 300, 400 feet of silt, gravel and soil. Yeah. And where there were hillsides and mountainsides, they were white out. or where there were uh, riverine system or estuarine systems, they were rerouted, they were redirected or blocked off and, or they perhaps turned into freshwater lakes. There was such vast topographic and geographic destruction and upheaval that took place from the first mud flood through to the second mud flood, the third mud flood, the farming collapses, obviously, from all the volcanic activity. There were so many things. And back then, we didn't have the Internet. We didn't have the kinds of photographic equipment that that people have today it was very difficult to record what was going on. It was a very convenient time, wasn't it? It was, it was a very, it was, uh, you know, chronicler. You camera a, wasn't out, yeah. photographic evidence wasn't out. And then, you know, the turn of the, uh, yeah, 18th century. That's a, that's a funny one. If you look at it, you couldn't imagine being a historian or a chronicler that would travel into those areas because it would be too hazardous. Yeah. Um, so there's um, and where what would you find when you got there? There was once or oh, there was once a town here or a city here in this part of you know Great Tataria in northern Russia or that part of Great Tataria in northern Russia, and it's all gone. Yeah. They, they didn't have you know the modern kinds of excavation equipment you see on construction sites where they could spend months you know digging everything out and then sending in teams of archaeologists to find out you know what was going on or you know it 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 it, it was it was so disastrous so widespread so destructive so pervasive mm. and so when it comes to these pavement lights or shall we say the vault lights of Tataria this this again became another aspect of the repurposing of these incredibly ornate and elegant edifices or buildings that that many of which were stately homes or palaces the various healing temples that went on to become chapels churches and cathedrals apart from those obviously that were constructed specifically by the roman catholic church and the vatican city state but that's totally separate in terms of the historical timelines that we're discussing here to, uh, about great Tatar in northern russia and its colonies hmm. in, uh, in, geographically in other parts of the world do you think the they these basements or they would have been ground floor say but Hello. actually, when when they had this these these vault lights in Tartaria, they would have been used like almost like healing 
sort of rooms or or healing centers similar to the processes of the churches and the cathedrals and all these different types of somatic light patterns that came through the stained glass and things like that would it have been the same sort of way it worked in that as well but definitely because i mean if you take a look at the size of these stately homes or palaces and we obviously we've discussed in the previous sacred wisdom podcast about the the insane asylums or mental asylums in the united states of america and, and some parts of canada on yeah. the North American continent, which was so vast with no real what appeared to be access roads or pavements to get to those uh, premises and no visible way where they're surrounded by lots of trees and shrubs to have been constructed by thousands of uh, professionally trained construction workers. So we know that these basements of these stately homes or palaces, as with the healing temples of Great Tataria in northern Russia, could have been used theoretically and again, we're speculating here as basement level, you know, portable healing centers. They became, if you like, they were also esoteric shrines. Uh, you know, these these beautiful ornate healing rooms, and they could have used different types of lighting arrays. Again, the lights could have been different colors, which would have created different chromatic wavelengths that would have different beneficial and medicinal effects on the biological health of those Nordic Tatarians that were in those basement healing rooms, which yeah. effectively were esoteric shrines, you know, literally nestled away in these vastly ornate and elegant and sophisticated towns and cities where the Christ consciousness was so prevalent, was so adulated, was given such continual day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, emphasis by the Nordic Tatarians. So yeah, definitely. And obviously then, and and the psychological outlook of the Nordic Tatarians would have been, well, why not allow that multicolored light to then radiate out through the pavement lights or the vault lights, you know, in our towns and cities as an added um, health benefit to local residents walking by? Why mm. not indeed create a uh, completely uh, ambient type of urban environment where everybody feels included? There's healing everywhere, even when people are working in different types of employment, as they were doing, uh, you know, with incredible proficiency and productivity in the different towns and cities of Great Tatari and Northern Russia, as well as in other parts of the Asian continent. So I, I mean, would people, say there's some truth to the idea of basement healing rooms, uh, you know. And, it, and that's so productive. What an amazing environment to be in back in the, the, the days of Tartaria. I mean, imagine Absolutely. you know, a lot. I mean, we live in an age now where people are just so unhappy with work, their lifestyles, and the way it is, it's, it's families awful. are in so much debt, and so uh, people are struggling. This so-called cost of living crisis, which we know has been artificially, fa- it's been artificially induced for specific yes. reasons, and we don't have to discuss that. But you know, you know, it's awful to see, and you see here in the United Kingdom of Great Britain, where there's there's becoming a you know problems with health care for a lot of people, especially elderly people, old age pensioners. And none of this should really be going on. And yet Not when you all. take a look at the, the use of boundless telluric electricity in Great Tataria, Northern Russia, mm. they had these esoteric shrines or uh, theoretical uh, basement healing rooms in their, their stately homes or, or palaces. They had these beautiful healing temples with yeah. these huge geometric stained glass windows creating different chromatic wavelength effects for the families, you know, and individuals in these healing temples it's it's an it's 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 nothing like the material world of and you Western see people have built the mindset now mindset. that 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 is such almost like a fantasy it's been built into people's consciousness that it's not even a possibility well <laughs> that is very wrong all this stuff is coming back whether people want to believe in it or not this is all getting really happening me and Stephen totally believe this is going on and we are we are reintegrating all this stuff. Mm. And as much as we see some very painful situations around the world happening at present and also previous in the previous few years, uh, or throughout our lifetimes for for that, for if we go into that, we have to be aware of this and understand that positively we are going to move forward into this eventually. But it comes down to us. And like we spoke many times, you know, how we need to integrate the work on the self and, and the healing and, and do all the things. Inner work on ourselves is vital. It is. Because that will vibrate out. But Steve, I want to just 
because going back to the official narrative and stuff and what we've been told. So Thomas Edison invented the light bulb and, and this concept of emitting light. So just discuss Thomas Edison and his role in all this. How did he sort of come across with all this stuff? You know, how did he interpret the vault lights and these kind of things? Well, I mean, Thomas Edison was really there to to help with the rollout of the electrification of the towns and cities of the United States of America. The incandescent light bulb and the electrification of the towns and cities across the United States of America, and then obviously Canada, was just a repurposing of the boundless telluric electricity of Great Tataria and Northern Russia. So it was getting the, the, the American people, the Canadian people, ready for what would become uh, literally a cost of living process where they would have to pay for electricity. And the incandescent light bulb obviously would have been part of that by being screwed into a socket in the ceiling or on a wall. Then you click on a light switch or pull a light cord. That then comes on and you're paying for that electricity. And so you can see what was happening. It was just a huge corporate takeover in stages where Great Tataria was being descaled de- and removed from, from the historical timelines. And Thomas Edison was just playing his part. And he was then obviously, he was selected by the elites and secret societies, as well as people like Nikola Tesla. Obviously, his funding was stopped and you know the rest you can say is history really yeah and they went full steam ahead with the edison there we go it seems steve that the third mud flood date was like the kind of finale it was the final bam like over like this was this was setting the stage so what was going let's talk about that little period of time there well, we know that the third mud flood, it reached its most destructive phase on the 7th of June, 1892. And by that date, we know that the rollout of electrification and the beginnings of what would become chargeable electricity as a, a billing process was already starting to take place. The elites and secret societies were planning to make sure that they could make lots of profit from this new process where once the boundless or endless telluric electricity that was drawn down from the ether or the ionosphere above the towns and cities of Great Tataria and Northern Russia, as with its colonies around planet Earth, was going to be completely forgotten. That was not something that Homo sapiens or human beings on planet Earth were going to be allowed to remember or to try and reinvent or to, or in any way try and maintain that type of occult technology. Mm. So that's really what what we can see here was this turning point that was taking place that the, the when it you know when that third mud flood reached its most destructive phase on the 7th of June 1892 by then the complete change really had almost taken place it was literally the last remnants of great tataria that beautiful golden empire of the christ consciousness was literally exiting you know in terms of its presence here on planet earth it's um you know it's spiritual uh spiritual resonances were really just basically fading away and you know in and on our life journey maybe there was a reason for that we don't know yet and maybe we we un, we need to understand something maybe there was That's, something we I need think to it's understand. a rebirthing it's a rebirthing process so hmm. the whole the whole the fact that now great tataria is talked about in such a prevalent way there is so much video content so many individuals are g- g- researching great tataria we know obviously what uh is being discussed across the Russian Federation about Great Tatar. There's extensive amounts of uh, knowledge or information concerning Great Tataria that had once existed across northern Russia and elsewhere. Mm. And it, you know, and it, but again, none of it's being translated from the Cyrillic Russian into the English language. And that's one of the main problems is there's so much of information now in the Russian language that hasn't been translated. Uh, you know, into the English language, but it's out there. It's definitely there. I, I've seen numerous pages of information on various blogs and forums in the Russian language, um, you know, various JPEG or PNG. You've done some incredible community. research into that, the translations and stuff. It's very impressive, Steve, what you, yeah. how you've brought that alive. A lot of people expect it all to be on Google and, and searchable. We're in the first top 10, 10 searches 
of uh you know it doesn't work like that you have to dig deeper and look look for this information uh but it is out there there's there's old tartarian books as well you can find online and you can actually purchase some people are selling books old tartarian books as well i found yeah, there's a there's a lot of um old books out there um incredible information and a lot of them are written in old english it's you know it's not what your class is a modern english style so again for some individuals they may find it a bit much to read it's very complex very intricate grammar but if you actually just concentrate on the information and slowly read it and then try and absorb what is written there by Mm. these historians or chroniclers and and therefore there were types of really travelers who went to these different geographic reaches in parts of northern russia and also into eastern russia you know and they traveled into the kola peninsula of the mamangsta blast of northwestern russia they traveled up into the fringes of the polar urals and the northern urals of the amalo nanet autonomous ukrug in north central russia all the way across to the akus peninsula in the russian far east and siberia Mm-hmm. And what they had, what they observed, you know, 150, 200, 250, 300 years ago was astounding. And just as Stephen said, everyone explore Russian archaeology, look into northern Siberia and look at what they found, because there is some incredible finds in that part of the world that never get into Western media, yeah, not at present any anyway. consideration to any of it. And yet it's validated by archaeologists and many of the anthropologists. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, from the Russian Federation, these are fully trained, qualified, and 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 recognised professional academics. So, well, thank you, Stephen, and it's amazing as always. And there's so much to cover on this subject, and we give little bite-sized bits of information, so you can go and do your research and find things out. We do have a book on Tartaria coming out next year, so please look out for that, and we'll keep you all updated with that. We do have a chapter in our book on Tartaria, which is called Mysterious Realities. It's out at present, and that's available on Amazon and Kindle. And on paperback, you can order. You can get it within a few days if you order in paperback. So thank you, Stephen Denman. It has been amazing as always. You you are a wealth of knowledge, and uh, everybody's fully appreciating you bringing this information to them. So thank you, my brother. And for now, okay. it's a bye from me. And it's goodbye from me. Thank you.